And our guest speaker, as you all know, is uh, none other than Daniel G. Uh, Daniel is a partner in the sports group at Sheridan's, and he regularly provides advice on the various FA, EPL, EFL, UEFA, and FIFA rules. Um, Daniel has significant experience in the practice of sports law, and he has spoken at several global conferences on matters such as broadcasting rights, multiple club ownership, financial fair play, uh, agent rules, and third party ownership. Uh, Daniel has also written articles in the World Sports Law Report and the Entertainment and Sports Law Journal, to name but a few. Um, and in today's, in today's webinar, uh, Daniel will be talking us through some key and interesting points related to broadcasting rights, football agent regulations, player contracts, commercial and football boot deals, and image rights. Uh, if you have any questions for Daniel, please write in the chat box. You should all know where the chat box is, hopefully and we will try and go through um, your questions within the session on a per topic basis. So before we go on to another topic, we'll look at and pick some questions um, for Daniel. Then in the final 10 minutes of the session, we will open the chat room for additional questions uh, for Daniel. And um, hopefully Daniel will be able to answer those and help us out. Now, having gone through the introductions, I will open the floor for Daniel to take it away. Thank you very much, Jenny. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Super, so um, firstly, thanks for the opportunity to um, uh, to speak to the students. Um, I've had a long um, history, which has been great alongside UCFB. Some of the first talks I gave a long time ago were to um, UCFB students, and it's great to, to be back and talking to everyone, hopefully, We'll be able to actually do um, a physical session sooner rather than later as well which would be great so everybody can be um, in and around one of the campuses as well and we can uh, get a bit more face-to-face -face stuff so looking forward to that soon as well so for the next um 45 minutes or so first half of um, uh, the game what we're going to try and do is talk through four or five topics which i think are relatively um, pertinent um, in the football space um, they generally relate to Bees, that's how I tried to um, set them up, which is more or less as um, anybody put in the, the, the blurb beforehand. I want to talk a bit about broadcasting rights. I want to talk um, a bit about brokers, which is basically agents. I then want to talk about bonuses as part of football player contracts. Uh, I don't want to talk about boot deals if possible. And then if we're going to have a bit of time um, in the end, also about image rights and those companies in the past have been set up in the, the BVI. So they are the five Bs um, that we talked about. Um, I chatted to any as well beforehand about um, trying to get as much interaction as possible. So please, 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 um, as and when you have questions, please do put them in the, um, in the chat box. What I'm intending to do if possible is after each section, I'm going to start off with broadcasting right soon. Um, I'll give everyone just a couple of minutes or as you're going along on each particular section, um, ask your questions and any Good pertinent ones that I think will add hopefully something to the conversation we can add in. And that I think will be um, sort of interaction that we can start with. And I think if it's all right, depending on how much time we have left at the end, then we'll just maybe have um, a, a broader 10 minutes on why a wider QA on particular other topics that maybe I haven't been able to cover in too much detail, but might be of value and use to um, the students as well. So um, on that note, what I wanted to do uh, was to start talking about broadcasting rights. Um, I, a, few, a few of you might know that uh, relatively recently I wrote a book on the football industry called The Deal. And when I was writing it in the first place, actually, uh, I thought long and hard actually about you know, where broadcasters um, sit within the, the football ecosystem. And my view generally is, although it is the players and the clubs that are effectively, and the fans that are the heartbeat of the global game, to a large degree, um, the finance and the money and the distributions um, are very much at the heart. Nothing um, goes around um, the football ecosystem if there isn't the money in place. Now, in a uh, pre-1992 pre era, before the Premier League, and before broadcasting rights started to, to spike and spiral, um, you know, the main sums of money that clubs were receiving were more or less through some TV money, but you know, ticketing and commercial revenue and other types of sponsorship deals. You know, post 1992, what we've seen with the um, start of the Premier League, and I noted down some of the figures, 
was the first uh, Sky deal with the Premier League was a five-year deal worth 500 and, uh, sorry, 253 million pounds. Now, that's escalated in 2019 to 9.2 billion pounds globally. And what we've actually seen in the last right cycle, which I'm sure you have um, um, had talks on and have seen lots of detail on, is actually the three domestic broadcasters, three UK domestic broadcasters, B Sky B, um, Amazon, and BT. Their amounts have actually been eclipsed by the total amount um, that has been provided by foreign broadcasters to the EPL to the extent that the current three year cycle EPL deal is now worth globally more than 10 billion pounds over three years, as I said. And that obviously brings with it huge amounts of money and distributions um, for the member clubs of the Premier League and to a lesser extent. Uh, the EFL clubs by way of solidarity and payment, uh, parachute payment distributions too. So I think the first point to note um, is on broadcasting rights. Uh, and I think the associated point on broadcasting rights is this. The broadcasting rights figures wouldn't be as large if it isn't for a large subscriber base. And the reason why I say that at the moment, which I think is very interesting, is you, you all will have probably seen over the last few weeks um, the interesting trend, especially in the UK, from a report around um, uh, net and globally, Netflix um, subscriber base has actually um, uh, receded quite significantly, and is uh, and is um, estimated to actually drop even more significantly over the next few quarters. And I think there's a really interesting question because nothing is in isolation, nothing is not in parallel, as to whether now what we have with um, everybody having effectively micro bundles, you have Now TV, you have Amazon Plus, you have you know, Sky, for example, you have Netflix, you have Disney Plus, for example, or other, sorry, Amazon Prime, as I was saying. Um, instead of having traditionally what would have been um, a high yield premium subscription of phone line, broadband, pay TV, I think we're coming to that stage whereby you know everybody's picking and choosing their micro subscriptions to a large extent. And if that's the case, and the newer generations aren't spending the same amounts as my generation and above on um, the more traditional subscription models, then I think everybody needs to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the over-the-top space, the OTT space, for what's going to happen in the future with subscriptions. Because in the end, broadcasters and platform providers are only going to pay premium money for when they can get subscribers, retain subscribers, and those subscribers are going to pay significant amounts for those that premium content. So I think there's a really interesting cycle coming. It's probably not just yet, because as you guys will, um, will probably know, uh, you'll recall that the Premier League renewed the Amazon, uh, BT, and Sky deal for a further three years. So we're still four years away from the next cycle, but probably three years away from that negotiation is going to happen. Um, I think there's lots and lots and lots of interesting times ahead around traditional pay TV models, around the new micro subscription models that doesn't seem to maybe be as robust as everybody thought, um, and actually about how Premier League clubs especially, and clubs across Europe and the world um, are somewhat reliant on broadcasting revenues at the top level and how then, as a result, they can possibly de-risk their models by increasing other um, revenue elements at different times. But I'm going to just put um, one quick question that I'm going to ask everybody to put in the chat. So if you get your fingers ready, um, the, I'm going to do it in if that's OK. So the first person that gets the right answer, um, I will send some copies of Done Deal um, over to UCFB, um, and you can distribute these out. I'll leave any to be the judge um, in this matter, if that's all right. So um, fingers on the ready. So um, uh, it was a couple of years ago now, but uh, there was one club in world football uh, that broke the quarter of a billion pounds mark, pounds, euros, they just call it a quarter of a billion pounds mark. Um, for receipt of broadcasting rights in one season. So that would be a National League, Premier League, La Liga, or whatever else it might be, and the Champions League for those distributions as well. Can you tell me the name of the club 
that broke the quarter of a billion pound mark for combined national league distributions and champions league distributions okay so i'm just going to give that if that's okay just another 20 or 30 seconds and see what happens i'm not actually i need to have a quick look at the group chat so if you give me one second in he's smiling i'm not sure why there's some there's some interesting answers going on i presume yes yes they are okay here we go i'm looking at quite a few that's coming through um there's even capitals by some as well which is quite interesting so um uh, and if you were going to if you were going to be a betting man or a guessing man who who would you have as the team that broke the quarter of the first team that broke the quarter of a billion pound mark for broadcasting distributions in one season i would have said man united as well that would have been my guess okay right uh let's i'm just going to have a quick look at the, the ladder if anyone's got the right answer first um okay so it looks like the person that's got the right answer first is Oscar. Oscar said Liverpool, uh, and Liverpool is the right answer. And I'll tell you why in a way. Uh, the answer is Liverpool because um, in that season, they actually won the Champions League, which made them receive almost um, £100 million in um, broadcasting and distribution monies. Um, and they finished actually second in the league that season to Manchester City. But the way that the, 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 the distributions actually worked that year, which is quite uh, interesting, and it can happen sometimes, is that even though Liverpool finished second, they actually earned more money in distributions than Manchester City because they appeared on television more times. So, um, yeah, the answer to um, the, the pub question that you can now tell all your friends um, if you actually manage to go to a pub ever again, sure we all are, are in a little bit and um, is uh, Liverpool was the first team back in the I'm trying to think it would have been the 1920 I think season that Liverpool beat Spurs uh, in the final so um that's the uh that's the first bit that I just wanted to talk about on broadcasting rights just first as I said thinking about um the ecosystem where broadcasting sits the um the the, the primary position at the moment um of uh broadcasters being significant spenders of um, um, money in order to gain those rights in order to sell subscriptions and then the thing that we're starting to see I think which is um, a query over those subscription levels and how newer generations of consumers are consuming content which I don't think is sky decoder boxes anymore or set top boxes it's um, you know over the top dis uh, distribution channels like now TV like Amazon Plus, as Amazon Prime, and like other types of channels as well. And the query is, um, you know, are we seeing a bit of a fundamental shift or are we seeing, you know, that unfortunately at times where austerity might be coming in and the cost of living is increasing that the first things that drop are more of the luxury goods. So that's why I wanted just to touch on, um, on broadcasting rights. Um, I'm going to then just talk because I know everyone, uh, everyone's favorite topic a lot of the time uh, is football agents uh, and just talk for maybe 10 minutes on um, the agency game, especially because um, it might well be that some of you want to become uh, agents at different times as well. Uh, it might be that you want to know more about uh, the industry and what they do. Um, but I'm going to do another quiz question, if you don't mind. Um, and so if we can start putting another one uh, in the chat. So again, uh, the person with the, I'd say the nearest to 10 million, maybe, if that's all right, uh, is the, if gets the answer right first, um, we'll go. And then I see Neil's got a question that I might uh, answer in a second as well. So the question on agents that I had is um, who, uh, sorry, how much in the latest uh, figures from February 20 to February 21, how much uh, did were agents paid by all Premier League clubs? From February 20 to February 21, how much were agents paid? Okay, so as that is going on, I'm just going to have a quick look at Neil's question. Uh, figures are coming in very quickly. So with broadcasters being able to calculate current future revenues, now this is going on, as you said, 
will be more constructive model. How will the EPL manage the negotiation table when it comes around? Um, well, it's a good question, Neil. I think to, to your question, ultimately, um, it's not the issue right now because you know the truth is is that Sky, for a lot of their games, even in the in uh, the UK, only regularly get between half a mil and a million and a half subscribe or viewers subscribing to their games. So the question sometimes isn't necessarily eyeballs; it's actually willing subscribers, willing to reoccur. Um, and pay for effectively premium Sky Sports products. And I think that the real interesting question on that is whether actually at some point in the, Premier, in the future, like people have talked about with Prem Flicks or otherwise, about whether the, the Premier League actually unbundles from um, a big broadcaster and first guy that goes it alone, or whether actually um, a, a channel will just be dedicated to Premier League like we have with Sky Sports Football or otherwise. And whether there's value just in that silo um, alone. So um, I'm just going down the um, uh, the answers quickly. So the, just a quick reminder: the question was uh, February 2021. Uh, how much were agents paid by Premier League clubs combined? And um, some really interesting answers. Um, so uh, Harry uh, Tierney uh, said 270 million pounds. Uh, he said it as the first answer as well. The actual answer is 272 million pounds. So um, yeah, congrats, Harry. If you uh, if you don't have a book, um, I'm more than happy to give you one. If not, then uh, <laughs> then I don't know. I'll uh, try and think of something else. Um, so that was that's the answer. So completely right, 270 million pounds. But I think what's really important to understand is the narrative and the context behind that number. And the reason why I say that is as follows. I'm sure most of you will now know, or at least from people that have come in to speak to you or from books and um, journals that you've read, is that um, agents are not usually paid by their clients, the players. I'll just repeat that again, but most of you hopefully should know that agents and don't tend to be paid by the players agents tend to be paid by the clubs that are looking to do the deal if it's a renegotiation of an employment contract or a transfer and then a new employment contract and the reason why that um, is important is unlike in the us where talent nfl players nba players um, or otherwise um, pay their agents directly from the um, uh, their own wages. In this country, the way the tax system has worked to a degree is that um, there's been an evolution more or less of how um, agents are paid. And as a result of this, what that effectively means for when um, this league table happens every year is you get a situation where everybody is somewhat outraged uh, by the fact that it's their club spending a lot of money on agents that may or may not be doing a good job, that may or not may not be fleecing their club, that may or may not have done a really good deal, may have brought in a good player that's being transferred on and off, etc. But I think the important thing to note there is is that that tends to be, and again, I don't want to get into too much detail on tax law and what uh, HMRC um, have, have dealt with over a particular period of time. But what actually happens is the club pay the player so I pay the agent on the player's behalf. And that is what's called a benefit in kind payment. And what that means is even though the player still has some tax to pay on it, he doesn't pay, he or she doesn't pay the full amount, but only uh, pays the tax uh, as a result. And the reason why I say that is then it becomes slightly controversial is that um, the reason I think why this way of being paid, the agent being paid has evolved is because of one quite specific factor that I don't think is given enough coverage. The specific factor is, is that if a player was to pay his or her agent, it is not a deductible expense from their tax return. So I'll just say that again. If a player was to pay his or her agent under the UK tax regime, it is not a deductible expense. Whereas in the US, and my understanding in some of Europe as well, it is potentially a deductible expense. So if, for example, you were to pay, a player was to pay his or her agent a million pound commission on a five million pound deal, that is not deemed a legitimate disbursement for their purposes, which means that what ends up happening is that it's better from a tax perspective, so long as it's within the realms of 
um, how the deal should be structured for a portion of the commission to be paid by the club because it actually leads then to a reduction, a reduced potential tax liability for the player so long as the agent is for um, um, go, uh, is effectively providing services to the player and the uh, and the club accordingly. So, what I mean by all of that, and hopefully I haven't lost you of the words tax um, and HMRC, is that basically, um, if the new headline was multi million pound player pays his or her agent one million pounds, nobody would be fussed about that whatsoever. But it's merely the fact that actually at the moment, the way that the structural matrix of a number of UK tax regimes and other tax regimes work is that actually this potentially in some respects can be can be a more tax efficient way of the player effectively paying less tax so long as it's in the boundaries of what's acceptable under HMRC guidelines. So that's what I wanted just to touch on in terms of um, agents fees. The one other thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly as well, and subject obviously to, to chats that we'll have in the chat room after this, was there is a really interesting debate going on at the moment in relation to um, FIFA wanting to cap um, the commission that agents can be paid. So at the moment, the idea um, and the suggestion is from FIFA, who are going to start re-regulating the agency market, is that um, a maximum of 6% of a player's annual base salary and um, can be paid by way of commission to a player's agent and a maximum of 10 percent can be paid to an agent acting for the selling club in trying to transfer um, a player out whereas some of the times in deals we i've seen that can be up to 10 percent more or less or otherwise but i think the main point is that the agents feel is they shouldn't necessarily be fettered in their ability to charge a you know a market fee and shouldn't be regulated by um, uh, an organization that perhaps doesn't quite understand how um, the market works. And, you know, there's always a populist approach, which is our oh, agents don't do it very much, and then it shouldn't be entitled to £500,000 worth of commission for making three phone calls and then doing a deal the next day. But the truth is, in practice, that doesn't really happen. Um, deals um, and relationship building and getting deals over the line and finding solutions and networking well and getting things done. Um, there's a lot of invisible work that agents, very good agents do on a daily basis, which a lot of the time doesn't come off. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think uh, the best agents are the ones that um, extract maximum value for their clients, um, but at the same time, um, strike a hard bargain in truth. So, um, you know, I think ultimately the, the point uh, that a lot of people have said is, well, why aren't music agents um, regulated in the amount of commission that they should make. Why aren't um, you know artist agents? Why aren't musicians? Why aren't um, you know comedian agents done in the same way? And everybody says, well, it's different. It's football. I can agree. I can understand that to some extent. But again, I think this whole debate goes away if, for example, um, the issue actually becomes um, whether the um, player pays his or her agent directly rather than um, the club paying on the player's behalf. So on that note, Inny, did we have any uh, questions on the chat in relation to, to agency fees at all? Yeah, yes. Um, just to first pick up, pick up on Ian and Harry's questions, they're both asking about conflicts of interest um, when an agent is working for uh, both sides, especially based on your point that um, it is the, the the sports club who is going to pay the agent. So what happens then? Is there not is there not such a a, a conflict of interest interest? And how what is the workaround or, or what happens then? Exactly right, exactly right. And it can cause an issue uh, in my experience at different times. Um, can if you are the player's agent, but also acting on behalf of the club, uh, how are you able to negotiate with the club to maximise the value of wages? If, for example, you're still have a duty um, to act for the club for certain services that you're providing to them as well. Usually what happens is based on the FA intermediate regulations and um, different um, uh, legal concepts around you know, fiduciary duties actually in lots of different ways um, is um, the player has to effectively sign a waiver um, explaining or rather setting out that they understand that there is a conflict but they're still happy to proceed um, on that basis. So uh, there is a waiver usually in place. Now it can actually become more complicated 
where an agent can act as a selling club, buying club, and the player, um, which obviously causes even more multiple um, uh, and inherent conflicts of interest that potentially arise. Um, and there, you know, at the moment, it's not outlawed by uh, the FA under its regulations and not by FIFA under its regulations. But my understanding is the new regulations that are going to be implemented by FIFA will outlaw multiple representation. So you will be able to, as an agent, act for player and, for example, buying club, but you won't be able to act for selling club, buying club and player at the same time. And I believe just piggybacking off that point, I believe there's some sort of uh, um, a cap that's also going to be introduced if if that situation were to were to um, arise. There's another question from Neil, which says, um, "Do we, are we going to see an evolution occurring following the uh, um, KD, um, Kevin De Bruyne deal and how he was able to um, negotiate a new contract using um, statistics rather than uh, being represented by by a football agent?" Yeah, I I still think to a degree uh, that the De Bruyne deal was an outlier. Um, for the following reason. So what I would say firstly is that all of the top agents and agencies that I'm working with um, uh, that um, are negotiating uh, renegotiations of contracts or and or transfers and then uh, wages for new deals, um, they're all uh, plugged in to um, data analytics companies and consultants that are working with them to benchmark what the amount should be. So it's not just a finger in the air approach, um, it's benchmarking analysis based on underlying performance, based on where they are in their careers, based on you know comparable players in various leagues um, uh, at, at different levels of their, all same levels of their career. So the first point is, is that any savvy agent um, negotiating a big deal uh, would be silly not to be able to work with these types of companies that are doing a great job to be able to um, understand the inherent value of a transaction. And so, for example, the podcast that I do regularly with Omar Chowdhury, who's a 21st group, they do a lot of that type of work, along with other you know, really good companies too. The other bit that I should mention on De Bruyne is, you know, the, the, in effect, it felt like, could be wrong because I wasn't involved in the deal, that actually what was happening is there was going to be a renegotiation um, at, at a certain price. So to an extent, sometimes agents um, find their value by knowing the dressing room and understanding probably what the inherent value of other comparable players' deals are, but also in leveraging the interest from other clubs. And that's a massive part of the, um, of the game, in effect, which is you always need a viable alternative to be able to then go and negotiate as hard as you can. And that's fair enough if De Bruyne was aware that actually he wanted to resign and maybe there wasn't a huge um, variance in what Manchester City were willing to offer, which then led to a smoother uh, process. But I think the third thing that's really important to note is usually when agents are renegotiating deals or other players are negotiating with clubs for, for uh, new contracts, it's very rare that they are out of contract with an agent at that exact or precise time. Now, it might well be that a player waits another six months to, so that their representation contract finishes with a certain agent and then the new agent comes in or potentially comes in and then does a particular deal. But in this instance, it was quite quite rare that the deal had run out apparently and then no new agent was on board and they felt comfortable to be able to do it themselves. So I think on the De Bruyne stuff, it's timing. It's the, the fact that he was on, it seemed like he was going to stay. Um, and then it became a matter of the value, the objective value of his worth to the team. And I think it's also because maybe, you know, he's a bit older as well and uh, the amount of time he had left on his deal perhaps as well. So there were lots of factors which I still think make it an outlier um, for, the, for all of the reasons that I sort of mentioned as well. But that doesn't stop obviously any agents working with good analytics companies to try and understand um, value. Fair enough. So there's two other questions on football agents. Should we go through those questions or do you want to come back yeah, to them? For now, that's all right. I'll try and give. I can get that look. So uh, do you, want, you can read it through by all means. Okay. So yeah, um, Joshua is asking, how do you see the role of super agents such as Kia, Kia something, I can't pronounce that, uh, affecting football going forward? And do you see more of a monopolization of player and staff recruitment through the client, through the client's of these super agents? 
I think there's a short answer which you, you, you don't necessarily know in truth. There are I don't necessarily think it's just super agents in truth as well. I think there are super agencies right now. You know, the agency market is becoming much more consolidated, especially in the UK. You know, you have ICM possibly um, that, that took over Stellar and Base um, that was taken over by CAA and that potential consolidation. You've seen unique sports uh, consolidate with um, uh, a foreign uh, agency as well. And then there's other agencies, obviously, like Wasserman Group, for example, that are huge as well. So I think what you sometimes see are very large now, at least in Europe anyway, a very small number of, a very small number of very large agencies that contain a lot of very high profile um, agents that are doing some of the most high profile deals full stop. Um, the brands of names like you talk about, um, Kia or Mendez or Riola or otherwise, they're always going to be there because they've got the power of their very high profile players that they're doing you know, huge deals for at some point. And they'll have a big team and a big structure behind them as well. So I think more of the trend might be you know, how much more of a consolidation of the European market for agency, a football agency market can there be? Um, and then uh, is it still very much the outlier that you have whatever you want to call them, super agents, that whose names um, sometimes are um, uh, up in lights a lot of the time, rather than the, the agencies, the large agencies. You don't necessarily hear of all of the agents, but you hear the names of the agencies rather than that. So sometimes it's actually the company name versus the name of the individual agent, perhaps. Right, and, and the last question on agents from Emmanuel says, um, is it common practice that agents negotiate an agent's fee, i.e. a percentage of the player's contract, as well as another fee for getting the deal done? Um, he provides the example of uh, 49 million being paid to Raul uh, in Popper's transfer to United. Yeah, it's a great one. And it's what we actually touched on uh, just a few minutes ago about um, at the moment, at present, it is possible to be able to, um, for, the, for the player's agent, to represent the selling club as it, it was reported at least that Riola did with Juventus and also acting for the buying club in uh, negotiating that um, Pogba's employment contract. So it's not that common practice in truth, only because I can only speak from my experience, I don't see it too often, but it does happen. Um, and I think the reason why at least it happened in that instance was, um, you know, lots of particular reasons. And I'm, I'm just guessing, so again, I wasn't involved in the deal, but if, for example, you are Mino Riola and you're speaking to Juventus and saying, you know, I can try and get, I can try and maximize the transfer fee that the club will pay to you, Juventus, for Paul Pogba. And Juventus say, well, okay, great. We, we think we can get uh, 60 million pounds for him. And Riola says to Juve, okay, well, for every uh, euro, uh, or rather for every uh, million euros, I get over 60 million for Pogba for sale price. We'll split it 50 50, for example. So there's nothing to stop that being uh, part of an agreement, I believe. And then he was obviously acting for Pogba, and then he was obviously acting for Manchester United um, in, the, in a more straightforward way of things. Um, so I don't know whether that's what's happened, but I can imagine very much that that might have, that might have been the case. Um, as I said, uh, new regulations coming in at some point this year, I believe, will outlaw um, the three-way um, structure that I've just talked about. Um, so in the future, it's going to be tricky to be able to, you, well, you won't be able to uh, represent all the parties, so you'll have to sort of uh, pick and choose accordingly as an agent. Th those are all the questions about, about agents. Super. So um, in the, I was thinking of just touching on maybe one more topic and then having a little bit of time then uh, for those 10 minutes left to be able to then talk on various elements if that's all right. Um, yes. And I think if it's okay, what I'm actually going to do is touch on um, boot deals and commercial deals more generally, because I think this will hopefully be of, um, of interest to everybody as well. And what I'll try and do is link it into image rights contracts as well, because they almost form part of a slightly wider um, a, a wider discussion piece as well. So I think the first thing that's always really important to note is um, whilst maybe a lot of people think that football players have lots of different um, commercial deals and they're always entering into 
new contracts to endorse a particular new product. On the whole, on the whole, the vast majority even of elite footballers, and in my experience in the UK, the, the Premier League, will tend to only have one primary uh, endorsement deal, and that will be their boots deal. And that's with Adidas, Puma, New Balance, uh, Nike, um, um, I've definitely forgotten a few, but uh, they'll come back to me in a second. Um, and effectively, uh, what will what will happen is the uh, brand will pay the player or the player's image rights company, we'll come on to that in a second, a particular amount of money, uh, plus probably some um, goods and services, or rather goods rather, which is the actual uh, brand um, merchandise itself, to be able to then use um, the brand's football boots for matches and training, and also usually for uh, wearing their merchandise uh, in a personal capacity when they're out and about doing their shopping or going about their, their daily lives. And I think the important thing that I always try and stress, especially to all the players when they're entering into these deals, is that a boot deal isn't just a boot deal anymore. And the reason why I say that is because not only do, do they uh, does he or she uh, have to wear the boots uh, and um, and make sure that they're not obviously wearing any other um, uh, brand boots or otherwise, is that effectively they're tied in to not wear, if they're a Nike um, ambassador, you can't be wearing Adidas, you can't be wearing Puma, you can't be wearing New Balance. And actually it's usually a lot wider than that in terms of the brands and makes that then um, a particular manufacturer will ensure that the player doesn't um, even wear, never mind, endorse. So the first thing is there's usually quite stringent um, prohibitions on competitor products as you can imagine the other thing that's always worthwhile bearing in mind is not only is a boot deal not a boot deal in terms of you know there are brand restrictions there are also lots of category restrictions so a lot of the time when i'm looking at boot deals for various players and i'm just looking at um the, the categories now usually what um bra uh, boot deals uh, boot manufacturers will say is that actually they will carve out additional additional categories for where players can't enter into deals with. So usually it revolves around electronics company, headphone manufacturers, watches, fragrances, uh, what um, uh, eye care, skin care, healthcare stuff generally, and uh, hygiene stuff as well. So um, the point being is that what actually happens a lot of the time is when for example, a player is lucky enough to find other deals outside of their main boot deal that might be, let's just say, a watch manufacturer or a skincare range. Usually those, those products and those categories are excluded categories. So you would not be able to do those without, do those, enter into those deals, mainly without actually the boot manufacturer's consent, which sometimes is difficult to be able to get in truth. So always what we'll try and do in terms of a boot negotiation is actually say to the player, are you happy to have these um, sectors um, and these groupings of potential commercial deals marked out? Or actually, are we looking to actually try and commercialize your image a bit wider? And we need to actually carve these out of the deal, which might actually mean you get paid slightly less, but ultimately might still be worth your while in the, the medium to, to medium to long term. So that's always the one thing that's always an important um, Point to note. The other one that again that always usually comes up in terms of discussions um, relates to the interaction between a player's personal brand deal, the player's club apparel deal, and the player's international club apparel deal. So, for example, to give the easy uh, one is you might be Harry Kane who's sponsored by Nike individually as a personal capacity. Spurs are sponsored by Nike, and then England is sponsored by Nike. So you have a complete brand alignment for, for Harry Kane. But in other cases, you have brand misalignment. So you could take uh, Ronaldo, for example. So Ronaldo is uh, a Nike personal athlete, is with um, Manchester United, whose apparel brand is Adidas, and is with Portugal, whose brand is Nike, if I remember correctly. And the reason why you say that is that what you always want to be careful about is the interaction between personal, club, and international. What the boot deal will usually say is you can't wear 
a competitor's brand unless it's in relation to your club or international obligations. So, for example, um, even though, and I'll give you the, the, flip, the flip example, Messi is uh, Adidas personal, his um, club deal is PSG, which is Nike, and his international deal is Argentina Adidas. So the, the, the brand deal with Adidas will still allow him to be able to wear the PSG Nike shirt because you can't prohibit them wearing the, the apparel brand. But obviously then there's no problem with his uh, Argentina um, um, international um, uh, uh, appearances because he's aligned with his personal brand. So what happens is the player can't be in breach and it's the same the other way around. Usually image rights deals between a club and a player's image rights company will say, Sometimes you can't enter into deals with competitors of us, the club, but that doesn't include your brand deal, your boots deal, because it might be in the opposite way. If we're sponsored by Adidas and you're personally sponsored by Nike, that's not great, but we can't stop you um, having that type of tools of the trade um, deal. So the last thing I just wanted to touch on in boot deals, and all I would say now, if it's okay, um, if there's particular topics that I haven't covered um, that you want to ask particular questions about. Um, there's loads of topical issues going on at the moment. Um, it might be um, football governance stuff with independent regulators. Uh, it might be the new FFP stuff. It might be broadcasting distributions. It might be sponsorship deal. Whatever it is, start feel feel free to start thinking about the types of things and questions you'd like to ask because I'm I'm, I'm obviously open to answering anything that you guys might have. But the last point that I just wanted to mention on boot deals, which I think is actually one of the int most interesting uh, areas is as follows. The, usually the most important phrase that I see in a boot deal is the word retainer. And the reason why the word retainer is very important um, is because of the following. Um, a retainer is usually the base amount that a player or a player's image rights company will be paid on a yearly basis um, for wearing the boots his or her boots. But the issue that a lot of the time occurs is a retainer is usually linked to the category of club that the player is playing at at a particular time. Which means, for example, if you are, uh, let's just say an Adidas player, a uh, personal player playing for Manchester United, it is likely that your Adidas deal will say that Manchester United is a category one club, for example. But it might also say at the same time that Arsenal is a category two club, for example. And what happens usually is the retainer amount, the base amount, is usually predicated on the player being at a category one club. If, for example, then the player moves from a category one club to a category two club, usually that retainer will sometimes half in value. And the same can be true in inverse. Let's say you're a player at a category two club for a particular brand, and then you transfer to a category one club, that actual base retainer amount might go up significantly. And the reason why I say all of that um, is for um, the following reason. Usually when agents are entering into deals and telling their players, I've managed to get you 100 grand a year, 500 grand a year, 750,000 pounds a year. That's usually based on the retainer amount remaining stable and static. But what obviously happens in practice is that retainer amount can go up or down depending on the category of club that the player is at. And that's a really important uh, point in relation to the definition in a boot deal of the term retainer. And the second thing before we get on to the, the questions in a minute um, is the second element of retainer. So what usually happens, and this is a really important element that usually gets negotiated on quite um, significantly, is um, usually um, towards the end of the, the boot deal contract, it will say that your retainer, i.e. the player's retainer amount, reduces if the player doesn't play in a certain amount of uh, games per season. So the opposite is the case. If you if you appear, let's say, in 80% of your club games and 80% of your national international fixtures get yeah, international um, rep games, then your retainer will be the 100% amount. But if then it drops and you only play 50% Premier League games and 50% international appearances, 
your retainer can drop significantly. And so what you'll tend to have a negotiation on is not only what those percentage levels might be, but actually what is classified as an appearance under the boot deal. Is an appearance just for getting onto the pitch? Is an appearance you have to start for your club team and international team? Is it minutes played per season divided by the total minutes, for example? All of those types of considerations which are important. So for all of those budding football agents and sponsorship um, uh, deal, um, com company deal individuals out there, what I would simply say, especially on those boot deal amounts, is um, pay close attention to what the retainer amount starts out as and what it actually could be in a year or two's time, depending on whether the player suffers a really bad injury um, or, for example, goes up or down, um, manages to transfer up to a bigger club, Category 1 club, for example, or actually um, transfer away from a Category 1 club, which can usually significantly impact on um, uh, their boot deal retainer. Thank, thank, thanks a lot for that, Daniel. I just wanted to piggyback off what you've just said about boot deals and you know, expand on something that some of my students or I've, I've discussed with some of, my, some of my students in regards to sports sponsorship, and I wanted to get your opinion on this. So it's back to your point about um, brand alignment on the personal level, on the club level, and at the international level. So from your experience, is there a perspective or is there a notion from the commercial side, from a Nike, for instance, in terms of a player and what they post on social media, especially if there's that disalignment with the player's perhaps club side? Again, using as an example, someone like Cristiano Ronaldo posting uh, to his large following, posting himself repeatedly in a Manchester United kit. <laughs> Should that or would that be an issue, or should that be an issue, for instance, considering his his contractual uh, uh, relationship with Nike? Yeah, well, the short answer is, um, you know, if I was Nike, uh, I would prefer that Ronaldo, um, you know, posts more about uh, with with the Nike brand rather than the Adidas brand. Just like you know, if uh, it's Messi or um, I'm just trying to think of other players that aren't necessarily aligned, uh, you know, whoever else it might be. So I think the, the important bit there is, is that when you have a, a, per, a large personal endorsement deal, ideally, as a brand, you want to be able to maximize that exploitation right and minimize uh, club and uh, international right if, for example, they are not necessarily um, aligned. Um, but at the same time, you know, that any player will have probably quite, at the top level will have pretty significant, um, you know, posting requirements um, to be able to publicize the type of stuff they're doing, the brand that they're involved with, the type of boots that they're wearing, the type of things that they're doing, uh, the interaction they're having with people, um, and you know, all of that all combined. So I, I think it's I think it's a really fair point. Um, you really want to, as a brand, maximize that commercial exploitation right. And, and could that have an impact on how much the player is then paid because of, of that disalignment, I would say? Well, I always like to think of it the other way in truth, which is ideally then you take uh, Gareth Bale, for example, he's completely aligned as an Adidas individual athlete, Madrid, and then Wells. And I remember some reports at the time, it could be completely wrong, that Adidas were very keen on sponsoring Wales it might be one of the reasons because then it completely aligned Bale to, to them so they could have him in every single capacity as you know a frontline elite player bearing in mind this was not when quite when he was as ostracized with by Madrid as he possibly is now but when you know he was winning Champions League um, uh, trophies against Liverpool unfortunately in one final um, but I think it's exactly right I think if it's possible um, obviously brands if it's Mike and Adidas or otherwise love completely aligned footballers for all of those reasons is that it makes the, the the sponsorship activation and all of those that imagery and content very clean and straightforward and you can see why then they will go and try and align at least with a personal and club perspective sometimes and it leads to other questions like some people ask me sometimes you know uh liverpool as a nike uh, apparel team would they incentivize um, Liverpool to put some money into the pot to buy Mbappe this summer, for example, because he's a Nike athlete. And 
I don't think that would be the case in truth. I can't really see it, but it wouldn't be on the be, be, wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility if Nike or Adidas have you know their top three uh, best um, footballers that they think are the next up and coming uh, players over the next ten years, and they put something in the contract that says you know effectively if the club for sporting reasons decides to sign these players, then the sponsorship activation that we will enable for this club or that might increase by X amount because I presume it would be in their commercial imperative to to do that. So um, I, I haven't seen that type of deal, but I'll be surprised if there isn't anything out there um, along those lines. Very well said. Thank you, Daniel. So let's go to um, some of the questions we're in the final eight minutes or so. So Neil says, um, I listened to the podcast you recently did um, around the possible scenarios of Mo Salah's protracted contract negotiations. Uh, whilst you discuss the possible salary he is commanding and how much it may cost to purchase a comparable young player, including fees, uh, could work out the same total outlay. How would this be viewed? How would this be, be viewed, though, from a potential sell on value from the young player, as this would be a return on investment on this? So, would this be a better deal? And he says, Great podcast with um, Omar, by the way. Yeah, it's actually a really good point that I probably didn't quite consider, which is obviously when, um, if I'm when Salah signs a new deal, who knows whether we did, and we went through the sort of pros and cons from it from an economic perspective in truth. Signing a younger player uh, obviously potentially then means that there's resale value, and there's obviously less resale value in Salah being, you know, 32, 33 by the time if he was to sign a new con long term contract with Liverpool. But it's the, it's the actually the counter, the, the counterbalance risk, which is, there's no absolute guarantee that the player coming in will be a success and then will command huge monies if another team then comes in and wants to, to purchase the player. So effectively, you're negating the risk either way. You're paying uh, a player possibly over uh, uh, the odds of what Liverpool might be willing or wanting to pay, but you are effectively de-risking against the possibility of Salah um, not playing well because of his track record to date. Whereas, uh, you could probably spend similar amounts of money on uh, a younger player with the possibility of greater resale value and return on investment. But there's always the chance that they don't play well or actually they get a terrible injury and never up to the same level or they're not available uh, and or they don't contribute in the same way. So I think I think it's the same side of a different coin or the same, yeah, the same side of a different coin. Thank you. Um, Lewis asked, do you think that Jack Grealish's deal with Gucci will be game changing with footballers and fashion? Well, uh, I don't think it's actually, I don't know whether it's been announced. I remember I saw the reports a few weeks ago. Um, the, the Grealish deal uh, is an interesting one because Manchester, it's reported that Manchester City do their image rights deal slightly differently to other clubs in that they take quite a lot of possibly the personal um, rights to then be able to uh, to sell. So um, it can be interesting to see whether that, for example, is a deal that was brought to the table by uh, Greenish's agent, or whether that was brought to the deal, to, to deal to the table by, for example, Manchester City in their capacity as um, commercial agents, presumably to, to Greenish as well. So uh, that's always the first question. The second question is whether it's game changing. I mean, um, I, it, it, that would all come down to the activation in truth. Um, Gucci don't tend to provide, do high profile sponsorship deals for footballers generally. That's the truth. You know, um, Hector Bellerin was one of the first a few years back that was on um, uh, Paris Fashion Week uh, down the catwalk, but you tend not to see high profile footballers in, uh, in the fashion space going down the catwalk now. Whether that's going to be the case with Grealish or not, um, I don't know. So ultimately, game changing depends on you know how much they're willing to push the boundaries. Is he just going to keep you know uh, having a wash bag that he takes into the dressing room before and after a game, or is he going to be doing something a bit more groundbreaking um, across social um, and across the the fashion landscape, which will take him outside of you know that traditional you know footballer uh, silo? That's fair enough. Um, Emmanuel asks, says, I read a report in which Crystal Palace striker Mateta was paid £250,000 by Puma for a four-year boot deal whilst he was playing for Mines. 
and Mark says, in my eyes, this seems a lot. Are these type of figures typical for regular players not in a Category 1 club? Um, so is he saying that the deal, Mateta signed that, Mateta signed that deal now? Um, whilst he was playing for my Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a lot of money for um, a, a player at Mines at the time, the truth. I don't know whether it's 250 over four years, which is obviously not as much. Um, but if it's 250 a year, you know, that's a, that's a real significant um, um, outlay and investment by Puma for a player that wasn't obviously playing in a top club in a top league as, as, as yet. So that seems pretty high as the probably the short answer, I'd say. Very good. And we don't have any other questions, but I just wanted to just based on the, one of the earlier things you had mentioned when we we're discussing broadcasting rights. So from your perspective, would an innovative change to the broadcasting rights issue, would it be to remove the 3 p.m. blackouts? What do you think? What did you think about that? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's one of the things that I've actually talked to a lot of colleagues and, and people in the industry about a lot at the moment, because <clears throat> I think there's a wider issue going on here. And again, it goes to that wider point we talked about, um, about Netflix and the attention economy more generally. You know, everyone's talking about younger generations having shorter attention spans and, you know, not being able to concentrate on things for long, short periods of time. I, I'm, I'm, I think that view is generally relatively lazy, in my view. I think, you know, you only need to speak to kids and young adults that um, are consuming content across lots of platforms if it's youtube netflix um uh, twitch um or any other any other channel generally or any other platform as it, as it might be and the reason why i say that is that and i'm just plagiarizing from a lot of other stuff that i've read is that we're, we're in this attention space i think uh, now where there is so much content out there and available um, I don't think football is competing with football anymore. And the reason why I say that is that the 3 p.m. point, I don't think that if the 3 p.m. rule is, has uh, certainly um, uh, uh, certainly is banished, that um, certainly football eats itself. Like, for example, you know, a League One or League Two team that's playing at 3 p.m., um, that all of their fans suddenly then go and decide to watch um, on the TV at home um, Man United versus Liverpool or a lesser game or whatever else it might be. Those, those days of everybody sitting in front of a television and watching a game are long gone to, to a lot of people to the extent that I don't think now anybody presuming that um, fans who I think are obviously pretty loyal to their team and want to go and watch their team live um, is an absolutely substitutable product to watching another game on the television. And by the way, you can probably do both very easily. You can be at the game and stream and stream everything live as it is. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think the really important part in all of this is this attention economy is now leading to a situation where if anybody, if any football uh, regulator or industry individual thinks that actually the way to protect football attendances is to make sure other games of football can't be on live at a certain time. I think is deluding themselves to a degree. There are so many uh, platforms and avenues to be able to watch content generally out there that football isn't competing with football anymore. Football is competing with Netflix, with um, uh, Amazon, with uh, Minecraft, with, uh, you know, whatever it might be. So I think that's the, and, and my view on that is that's the really important element to consider now. You know, content is so ubiquitous and there are so many platforms that you can watch stuff from. I think, um, you know, that, that, that 3 p.m. blackout rule to a degree um, is from an era of linear television. And I don't think we're in a position and in a place of linear television anymore. We're in a place where kids, young adults, me and otherwise, are streaming stuff on the train, in playgrounds, at stadiums, whilst we're doing other stuff. Um, and... I think really, you know, my view is um, like the 3 p.m. rule isn't in existence in the Bundesliga and in other territories as well. I know that everybody is quite the traditionalist on lots of different features, but my view is is that um, it probably and should be on its way out. 
think. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, we have one more question or, or from, something from Neil, but I'm, I'm conscious of the time. It's, it's 3 p.m. Um, but I guess it's just Neil says, my understanding is the 3 p.m. review rule is on the review, but the high, but with high crowd attendances at the moment is the view that crowds won't go out, outdated. Yeah, I think it's more or less what we just discussed, really. Um, and, and there's quite a lot of empirical evidence out there which suggests that you know it hasn't necessarily impacted um, it hasn't necessarily impacted crowds in Germany and further abroad. So, you know, I I'm of that view. Is um, you know, as as we said, like I think pre the Premier League is competing with Fortnite. The Premier League isn't competing with League One, and League One isn't competing with the Premier League. You know, entertainment industry platform content sources are competing with each other and football and the premier league is just one silo of that very good um so any other questions or and if there's nothing else i believe we can conclude uh so many thanks to, to everyone for tuning in and listening to daniel i hope you have all learned a lot from listening uh, as i have um thank you to daniel again for the time for taking time to talk to us and to the employability and career planning team for arranging this session and um yes i hope you all have a, a good day and see you all soon so take care